And we're live, ladies and gentlemen. So welcome, Whiskey Brothers and Whiskey Sisters, to the third installment of the Alberta Scotch Society and Friends Whiskey Book Club. And a very warm welcome to our panel. Thank you for making it here tonight, everybody. And a special welcome to the two gentlemen I've been referring to lately as Canadian Whiskey Royalty. So we've got Davin de Caljabou. I say it with a French accent and I can't stop myself, sorry. The author of Canadian Whiskey, and we see this right here. There, there's a nice shot. And Dr. Don Livermore, the master blender for Hiram Walker and Sons. He's a Canadian master blender of the year 2019-2020. So I'd like to start this broadcast uh, as we did with the previous two, with a quote that gives us the broad strokes of what we'll be discussing today. Uh, it's in Davin Segue, section three of this book again. Uh, and it completely appropriate for our needs today. So I'm just going to quote his segue. Page 61, for those of you that are following with us. In the end, what the whiskey artist creates can be quite a masterpiece. One critic and connoisseur alike can appreciate with its balanced, robust, and delicate flavors that come vividly to life on the palate. Canadian whiskey is made to be enjoyed. And when given the chance, it can actually dance on your tongue. And with that, let's do some roundtable introductions. Lady and gentlemen, please, your name, your whiskey handle, or your other handles on the other forums we go on, and uh, what's in your glass tonight. And we're going to start with Davin. Hi, I'm Davin de Kergamo, or at Davin, D-E-K, on social media. And tonight I'm uh, drinking this drink that comes from, was bottled in... Uh, 2005. It's a 25-year-old Alberta Springs, and I'm drinking this specifically because it was given to me my, by my dear friend Jay Wheelock, and uh, Jay passed away this week, and so I'm drinking this in his honor. Thank you very much, Devin. That's that's fantastic. Uh, Don, we're going to go to you next. Hi, I'm Dr. Don Livermore. I'm on the Master Blender for the Hiram Walker Distillery here in Windsor, Ontario. Uh, I've been in the industry now for 23, oh, 24 years. I just celebrated my uh, work anniversary. Uh, I'm sure, yeah, ooh. <laughs> whiskey keeps your youth. I keep, no, no, I'm a doctor, but not that good doctor. Um, <laughs> however, uh, I am drinking tonight uh, this guy because Dolph told me to, if I can get it out of the light of my camera. There you go. <laughs> He told me this is what I should be drinking. Uh, I would drink this most nights, but there's very little little left, and that's Dr. Don's PhD in a bottle, with a lack of a better term. So, yes. Thanks for having me tonight, guys. Yeehaw. A pleasure, Nick. We're going to you. I'm Nicole with Whitfield, and I'm drinking the Pendleton 1910 tonight. And that was on one of the pages. You're drinking the exact thing. Good stuff. Uh, let's go to Kent. Hi, my name's Kent. I'm also known as Whiskey Ass. And tonight I am drinking some Canadian Club 20 year old. Nice. Also in the book, in this chapter. And. Hi, I'm Yukon Dave. I am doing some uh, Goodrich and Williams out of uh, Delta, BC tonight. Is that looking okay? So <laughs> almost, guys. Yeah, it's perfect. Good job. And let's go back to me. What we have for me is a fantastic, beautiful rye. You see that? And I'm doing a little bit different tonight. I'm, I'm, you know what? I'll explain it later. Let's, let's get into everything else without me bogging us down in too much information. So let's, let's put everyone on the screen so you can see everyone's beautiful faces. And we're going to start this off. So here we go. Uh, I don't know. Uh, if I let's just start this with a couple questions for both Davin and for Dr. Don. So, uh, Davin, I've been meaning to ask you this for the last three weeks now, and uh, I haven't been able to. But if you look on, let's say, page I don't know, 41, 42, or page 64, all the other orange background pages. So, here, these types of pages. Yeah. <clears throat> was it your idea to keep the information so succinct? And uh, yeah, 
let's just leave it at that. These types of pages all throughout the book, I love them. I'm a visual guy, and uh, UConn, Dave, and I love our pictures and books. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, you know, uh, I, I when I was writing the my book in the beginning, I had an old Seagram's training manual, and they did everything using these graphics. And so I adapted some of those graphics. Mm -hmm. Some of them I, you know, came up with myself. And then I got a, you know, a commercial artist to draw, draw them and make them all look the same and make them match the style of the book. But uh, so, so they, they, but you see them in this book. Those are original. But uh, a lot of the ideas came from uh, from an old Seagram's training manual. Nice. Yeah. All right. And if we could go to Doctor Don now, Doctor Don, here's your question. Uh, I'm going to cite you as quoted in Davin's new book. So we didn't talk about the new book. So this is Davin's new book. We're not talking about this tonight, but he's got a nice page layout of you on here. I'm sure you've seen it. So page 185. And I'll show everyone the picture as well. Eh. How's that handsome guy right there, eh? It's a good picture. All right. So here's the quote. Uh, he was promoted to Master Blender. It was a good week for Livermore, leading to good years for spirit lovers. I'm not standing still, he says when asked about the future. What's driven me is how do you make spirits better and find that perfect blend of science and creativity. And I'm going to highlight science and creativity. That's never going to change. So that's in the new book. And so my question for you, along with that quote, is uh do you see yourself more as an artist or a scientist or apparently from that quote both so in other words don are you the leonardo da vinci of canadian whiskey kind sir <laughs> maybe the, the picasso I, I i don't know uh, i thought you wanted me to say leonardo dicaprio <laughs> but no the leonardo da vinci the science and the art together um well, actually, there was a project once we, I, I told why I said that we called it Project Picasso. <laughs> and we were painting wax on the top of the barrels to try to uh, prevent uh, evaporation. And uh, I'll never forget that as part of my career. It didn't work out with the experiment it did anyway. Um, I think why Davin mentioned, just to go back to the original quote uh, as to uh, that was a good week for Livermore. So the same week in 2012, it would have been February 2012. I went and defended my PhD uh, in brewing and distilling at uh, Harriet Watt University. Uh, I flew over uh, uh, all by myself, to three hours in a room of just sheer grilling. Uh, they went through page by page by page. They asked me to leave the room and I was sweating in the hallway. I can remember there saying, oh my God, I think I failed this. Uh, what seemed probably was about, probably was about five minutes, seemed like a half an hour. Went back in the room and they said, congratulations, they shook my hand. Congratulations, Dr. Livermore, you're in your PhD, provided you made these changes. So um, three hours of my life. And I always say, I bet you when I was in the hallway, uh, those guys in the room said, ah, we got him on that. We got him on that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure let's that's how it goes. Let another 15 minutes. Let's, let's just wait. Yeah. <laughs> let's let them sweat it out there in the hallway for a bit. But uh and the, the same week I got promoted as to being the master blender. So it was one of the best weeks of my life, uh, certainly. And uh, for, for that, I think it really was doing my PhD was a springboard uh, uh, to what I do. And a lot of it was very scientific and a lot of it was analyzing uh, the, how whiskey matured in a cask. And I was, and that, if you look at the whiskey wheel, which we're, we'll probably talk about in a bit, yep. um, all those chemicals that can analyze and go right down to parts per million, parts per billion, parts per trillion. Um, and we probably more than ever have a good handle on the science of whiskey. But I'll, I'll always say this. I think there is a little bit of an art. Uh, when you're doing a blending, and I, and I can encourage the audience to try one of my blending one ones that I put on, there's certain ingredients that go together and there's certain ingredients that will clash. And, it, and it's just a gut feel and it's just an experience. Some things just mingle the right way. Some things just don't work out, whatever you may do. And I think that's where the art comes through. We can measure what those things are, but at the end of the day, you, you, you can't 
you can't. And the, the last thing I'll also say is this, is if you look at a whiskey barrel, there are big molecules that are on the barrel that we're trying to break apart. I think there's things that we still even cannot measure today scientifically with, with instrumentation. And I think that's, I think that's where aging into the barrel for a long time, are, I, I don't think we'll ever replicate it on a rapid aging. I, I saw rapid aging 24 years ago when I started. They not, were not on their door. I just think there's slowly things chipping away off a barrel that are unmeasurable uh, things today, to be honest with you. And, and that's, that, that's the art and the gut feel and, and the mixture of what marries together and what doesn't. All right. Good answer. Art, science, more science than art on your part, I was thinking, but everything is a science. Everything is art. And you, sir, are the Leonardo DiCaprio. You could be both. <laughs> a good looking doctor. You're done if you need to be. So this week we're focusing on flavor, aroma, and textures. So the next few questions are going to be on these elements as taste specific. So let's go to page 66. Uh, your quote, Davin, is still enjoying whiskey, still. Enjoying whiskey is all about flavor. So it's surprising how few people know where a particular flavor comes from. So Davin talks about corn being smooth, creamy, voluptuous, wheat, uh, creamy without the oiliness, barley is nutty and rye, mineral notes, lilac, ripe fruit, baking. Is there anything any of us could add to that description? Uh, something that we see generally in those grains. So let's see what people have. Anyone? Well, I'm not sure what it's supposed to be on the screen. There we go. I'll add just a bit. I'm going to say for wheat, I always get a lightness to wheat that I don't get to from from other, from other from corn or from, well, definitely not from rye. So it's lighter. It's creamy, but lighter. And barley, there's always a sweetness that I will get from a barley if it's all barley, 100% malted, unmalted, just a sweetness I get that I could add to that. Anyone else like to add to that list? Something you generally get with those grains? Anyone? Yeah, I kind of like some of the nuttiness that comes out of the barley. That's one that I always pick up on the finish. The nutty. Yeah. Yeah. Get a lot of that nuttiness in the corn. Yeah. Get a lot of that nuttiness in Irish whiskey where they use unmalted barley and malted barley, knowing in pure pot or things like that. And you, uh, get a lot of those nutty flavors. And Shelter Point is doing that too, using put mal uh, malted and unmalted barley and making like real triple distilled pure pot uh, Irish style whiskey. Oh, are they cooking that unmalted unmal barley then? They're, no, they're using malt to convert it. Okay. Oh, okay. Just yeah. to jump and in, I've, I've worked on some barley uh, through the years and there's, there's one, I think, major difference than more than malted or unmalted uh, is the use of a lotter ton. Beer people know that if if lotter tons aren't used correctly, the husk of barley will give it a stringent bite to the beer. That's when they know know that what they've shredded it way way too much, and and there's a bite that comes into it. So I the barley spirit we first made in 2015, uh, maybe 2014 at the Hiram Walker Distillery, we just shredded up the barley in a hammer mill, put it all together as a whole grain mash. I was quite frankly disappointed in it. It, it, it just had an uh, uh, off taste. It had some astringency to it. So the next batch of barley that we did, we, we actually partnered with a, a grain company where they dehulled it. They took the okay. shells off for it. So it's called pot barley. That's the barley you would get in soup oh, and oh. made a yeah. world of difference. And I think when you look at the Irish distillers, Davin, you, you talked about it, they use a lot of ton. The single malt scotch will use a lot of ton. And I think that's the key thing when we're looking at flavors and barley. And the, you got to be very careful with, with, the, with the husk when you're putting it into the mashes. Yeah. You can and also you didn't grow need the husk husk for, or, Oh, sorry. You didn't need the husk as you drained it as a filter? No, because the, 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 the company, the way they... Uh, process that they pearled it they called it or dehulled it uh uh and, and they make pot barley that's the stuff you'd see in soup basically makes makes a world of difference makes a huge difference hmm. all right wow next question so page 69 we we say this does that or using this will result in that does this seem to take away from the mystique uh the art of 
of drinking whiskey, not making whiskey, but just enjoying it? Does it take away from it when we overanalyze it, maybe? Overanalyzing for sure makes it, uh, it makes it less fun. But knowing where it comes from, you know, this is what people always talk about. I love the taste of the corn and I love the taste that they might be wrong, but they still like to be able to, to derive information from their flavor about how their whiskey is made. This is one of the reasons why people get so hung up on processes and things like that. But just to say how things happen or how things are done, does that spoil the mystique? Well, I don't know because, you know, if, if, you, if you know that if you mix red paint and white paint, you get pink, it doesn't make a painting of pink flowers any less exciting, you know, because you have that information. But what it does, it it allows you to to more uh, understand where the flavors are come from, are coming from, and also to step back and appreciate the whiskey that you're drinking, and you know, and see how what a masterful job um, the blender has done putting it together, or the distiller has done putting it together. So, to, to me, I think it. it, it, it this is what people talk about all the time. I love the rye in that. And they and they get all wild old wheated bourbons and you know bourbons with high rye and things like this because it they it tells them something more than just their palate tells them. So I think it I think it's really it enhances any experience to know to know a little bit better. I mean if you have a really hot car, you know how how the the transmission works and you know you know all the, the suspension and things like that it just makes you feel a little closer to the whiskey all right sounds <laughs> good don i'm gonna send that to you for a second uh can you comment on that knowing a whiskey so well and the components of it does it lessen your enjoyment of it or does it augment it somehow huh, uh <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> this is why I made that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it, it, to, to dovetail on on uh, on what Davin has mentioned, I think more and more than ever, we're seeing consumers wanting to know where their flavors are coming from. And I think that's the clever part about that whiskey wheel is you think you taste spices or you think you taste vanilla it really goes back to the origin of where those flavors come from. And, uh, and, and I think that's really what consumers are looking for. For me, th that I, I hate making tasting notes. I said that uh, last night was on, went on the air with uh, Mark Gillespie. Because um, th there are dead spots to me. Uh, and I openly will tell people my vulnerability, I can't smell coconut or taste coconut. But for whatever reason, that's the genetic to me. That's your that would be your trans whiskey lactones that would you would have in your in your barrels and it's a sign of good quality barrels but I can't taste it. Um, likewise, I'm I'm in charge of making uh, Malibu rum. I can't smell the coconut in it. I, and then there's things I'm very very good at. And I think I think when people overanalyze whiskey or if you even want to call it overanalyzing whiskey, I, I just think we're just sensitive to certain things, whether it's your childhood or whether the food experiences, wherever you've come from. I think that's what ends up being what you start detecting in your whiskey. I, I'm more about where it comes from more than maybe the descriptors and, and things like that, your whiskey. All right. Uh, I'm going to ask Nick specifically on this one. Nick, as you got into whiskey and started liking it more and more, and uh, I, I trust your knowledge of whiskey. We sit together a lot at tastings. And I enjoy your company and, and what you can contribute. And that comes from a lot of knowledge. Did that help you appreciate whiskey more? Or have you always loved it the same amount? I don't know. Maybe I'm full of crap. <laughs> <laughs> knowledge is definitely fun. And it helps. I agree with Davin uh, uh, with Dawn about um, having that knowledge of where it comes from does give you a different appreciation for it. It can make it a little bit stagnant, for lack of a better uh, term, if it's the same thing all the time. But it definitely you need that base. Alrighty, uh, Dawn, this one's for you to start, and then other people can jump in on this if we could. Uh, the quotes on page 69, whatever the various ingredients might contribute to flavor, their actual impact depends more on how the mash is fermented. 
and how the spirit is distilled and matured. So not the components, but what you do with the components. Uh, for for you, Don, when you're making your whiskeys, how how true is that for you? Let's go on up. I'll, I'll just put you back on here, Don. <laughs> okay. I don't know why I'm always in the middle. I'm trying to do this. I, I really I want it. this, but I keep not doing it. So I don't sorry, mind that. Everybody. I can see your reactions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, as the, maybe the audience knows, I don't, I don't know the level of, um, uh, knowledge on Canadian whiskey. So Canadian whiskey, not most for the large distillers really don't make the mash bills. Uh, we, we pretty much are, you ferment each of the grains separately, distill it separately, age it separately, and you put it together at the end. Um, probably the smaller producers or some unique flavoring whiskeys within the larger ones may make mash bills. Um, which can can give you different flavors. Um, for me, the yeast is the heartbeat of the distillery. Uh, most people don't realize it. It probably makes most of the flavor in your whiskey. Uh, it makes alcohol. Alcohol is a type of flavor. Uh, it gives a zestiness to, to whiskey. So I mean, it makes the majority of the flavor that, that, that is in whiskey. Um, yeast, uh, in, in terms of its contribution, I'll say, Gives you a green grass kind of note or gives you a herbal green grass what when i say green grass fruity floral soapy sulfur notes uh, we uh, are brewers first um, which means we can influence yeast to make any of those flavors um, we can change the sugar levels or the grain levels we can change nitrogen levels we can change oxygen uh, we can change the length of fermentation we can change the strain of yeast itself uh, we could pitch more yeast or less yeast, and we can make more or less of those fruity, floral, green grass, soapy, sulfur notes that the yeast has made. And I don't think people have that appreciation for it. Um, if I were to go to the local bar once we open up here and I sit on the corner bar stool on a Saturday night and talk about yeast with the bartender or the guy sitting beside me, they'd, they'd have no idea. It's a turnoff. And I don't think most uh, whiskey drinkers uh, have that appreciation for what we can do. The other thing I'll add, add to it as well is, yes, we can ferment and make all these flavors. <clears throat> distilling, pardon my pun, distilling shapes your whiskey. So whatever flavors those yeast has made or whatever flavors that comes from the grain, we, we know it's boiling point and running these stills and we can in, intensify them or we can strip them out depending on what we're trying to achieve. So. Um, I'll, I'll go back to, I mean, for, uh, Davin's absolutely right. Flavors from yeast and the mashing and the fermentation, it, it, we, we don't talk about it near enough. There's a certain few companies out there. The uh, Four Roses does a good job talking about yeast. Probably uh, two brewers probably will talk about yeast, I would think, in, in, from a Canadian. Yeah, not, not, not a lot. Yeah. So, you know, barrels are a lot more no. sexy than yeast are. They, they are. <laughs> it, to the oh, consumer, yeah. it is. That's what people talk about. They... Like in beer, they talk about hops. That's sexy. They don't want to talk about malt too much. And I find everybody asks you, what barrel is? What barrel did you do it in? And like, I, I never talk about yeast. Like, I mean, I, I, <laughs> I would be the th thought that would be the one in Canada that could do that. Um, but um, I just it, tell people, yeah, you know, we have a different, we have a longer fermentation cycle. That's all I talk yeah. about. Yeah, and it's a tough conversation, isn't it? Well, I understand. I don't think anybody else does. <laughs> what I understand and what you understand are night and day. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I, and that, that's the unfortunate part is that uh, we don't tell that story very well as distillers. And, and it's a difficult story to tell. And my dream someday is to, to go up there and talk about, yeah, I made this whiskey with this yeast and it gave me this flavor. And it's, uh, it, today, people don't care. You're right. It's a barrel is sexy. They see it, they understand it, they get it. I think grain would be your next future if you're thinking about it because people can see the grain in a field, they drive by it. But yeast, you don't see. I think that that's the struggle. Well, the other thing they talk about is how old is it? And that's that's the first question I hear. How old is it? I said, well, if you think older is better, then I'm the best guy in the room. And that's <laughs> You're beautiful, buddy. <laughs> but but I kind of agree with Dr. Don as well because uh, Dave, you and I make beer, and the yeast changes what we do in the beer that we make. So it, we can't maybe for work and when you're talking about whiskey at work, but you and I together when we're making our batches of beer, if uh, we don't have the right yeast, it's it's off. 
something. It's more than just having the right yeast, though, because you can change the environment. And so yeah. the same yeast makes different flavors in different yeah. environments. Yeah. Dress it out longer, more sugar, less sugar. Yeah. Well, change the temperature a little bit. Yeah. I was listening to the Westland guys talk a couple of weeks ago, and they talked about their Belgian yeast. And I found that really fascinating. I don't know if anybody else picked thought it was interesting, but I found it really, really interesting to hear. Yeah, they've been there for a long, long time. So they've developed populations of specific yeasts. Same with the, you know, the, the vineyards in, in Europe. You know, they've got hundreds of years of, of uh, you know, developing specific strains of yeasts in there. So they're, they're, they say wild yeast, but these are really specific strains that they have uh, developed over centuries and centuries. But one of the one of the yeah. uh, sorry to cut you off there, Davin, but I was going to no. say one of the pioneers of barrel finishing was Bill Lumsden, uh, and we and that was twenty years ago when he started doing those. I'm funny he's seeing Bill now launching whiskeys. He's talking about a unique yeast strain. So is he a trendsetter or a pioneer? Is that is that foretelling the future of us as uh, brewers and distillers? Are those questions that people are potentially going to start asking? Yes. I think for the most part, most people just don't realize how important yeast is to the whole process. It's just that hidden gem that's out there and it's just a never, never land. And it's left into your guys' hands to make it what we drink. And we trust you. Yes, <laughs> you. Uh, I, I was on the, uh, on um, our own, uh, the Wiser's uh, Instagram live this week. And I talked to the guy from the, the distiller from TX distillery and we, we got on this, he's got a PhD in biochemistry, but uh, that's why he hired the guy. He went and found a unique strain of yeast on a pecan. And he was telling me the pecan is the, uh, the national or the state, whatever nuts or whatever the case may be. And that's, that's the yeast that they okay. use. And I, I said, what, what could we do for Canada to go find a wild yeast and somebody chipped along in the stream and said, oh, maple tree. Somebody said. Was, what? <laughs> Nothing more Canadian than maple trees. Maple yep. tree yeast. There you go. There's, there's a product innovation for somebody. <laughs> go ahead. I'll, I'll let you have it. I won't say anything to it. Uh, I'm going to do a, a thumbs up and thumbs down from the panel once I read this, if I could, just to see what your everybody's opinion is on this. Uh, page 70. The fun is in the nuance. And the more you taste, the better you will become at detecting that nuance. Do we agree with that? Yeah, I'd say sure. Maybe. Okay. okay. We're good. Uh, what makes you think so? So, Dave, you piped up a bit, so I'm going to pick on you. But right back at well, for me, I, I mean, I've only been doing this for 13 years, so I'm really learning a lot, and I'm learning from our distiller, and it's so so interesting to see when he changes the malt bill a little bit, the different flavors that come out, and some of the malt I know from the beer side, so I can pick up that flavor. I said, yeah, that's this malt, and that's that malt, and I find that really interesting, and now I'm starting to learn about Canadian whiskey, and now i got to go out and buy a whole bunch of stuff, so, <laughs> so yeah. I want that, to how they all differ. And it brings me right to this guy who, uh, until we started doing this book club, I think you said you had two bottles of whiskey or two bottles of Canadian whiskey. Two bottles uh, of Canadian whiskey. And now I'm uh, several dozen in. <laughs> and I have all of it. <laughs> uh, he's a little OCD too. When he gets his hooks on something, he's in there. He does it all. Yep. Uh, and taste-wise, what are you getting now that you didn't get before from Canadian whiskey? Maybe something that you're seeing. Well, rolling back to even just a little bit, I I was always Canadian whiskey's always just been that crap, basically that you go, you mix, you get drunk on, and never thought more of it. And then we get into this book, and I start tasting, and it's really interesting how you know I've come through, and I've never been a big rye guy. It's just never something that's really grabbed me. I'm more of a rum. I definitely fall to the sweet side of things. And I understand that. But I'm finding that now going through uh, the different nuances as I go through the bottles and the rums that I'm, or the rice mixtures with the grains of bean, corn and, and barley, I'm developing a lot different flavoring and tastes and I'm quite enjoying it. And I'm finding just a whole new avenue of flavors that I never really touched on before. 
Excellent. And we're going to you, Nick. Uh, at what point in time, if I could finally do this, at what point in time did you really develop your palate where you knew that your palate was kicking in and that you were telling the difference or could differentiate the different flavors? When, when did that start for you? Because you've been in this game longer than me. I've been drinking I'm, longer than you, but you've been analyzing it longer than I I would say three, four years ago, it started to kick in. I've been doing a lot of wine tasting, um, developing my wine palette. And I just, I dove in hardcore into the whiskeys, into trying to buy as many and tasting as many and exchanging as many just to expand my knowledge and find the different flavors. And then to balance it, I was trying to taste as many different foods and explore the foods to pick up nuances from foods that I would then find in whiskeys. Good answer. I agree with it. And back to everybody if I do that. And I did the wrong one again. Uh, I'll, I'll get better at this in one day. You'll see me getting better, Davin, by the end, I'm sure. Like in two two more, three more weeks, I'll be fantastic. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> We've had a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. Don, I'm going to ask you in a second to, to go over the flavor wheel because this is your creation. This is your baby. And I've got to thank you for it, too, because uh, about a year ago, might be a year and a half ago, I contacted you and asked you for a digital copy of this so that I could print it off and have it kind of in the corner when I do a tasting, just have this as a tasting kind of guide. I didn't have these, but I wanted to have it with me. And what's important to me was that they are Canadian flavors that you talk about. And I know you get very geeky and scientific on the outside, which I love, but We've seen a lot of tasting wheels from other people, and I'm with SMWS, and theirs are it's it's very focused on their food, their drink in Europe, which might be very different from ours. So I really appreciated that part of it as well. But if you can talk about it, and everyone else get ready, because after Don talks about this, we're going to talk about what's in our glasses with a little bit more precision, a little bit more spunk. So Don, I'm going to click on you. Dolph, I don't get to answer the nuance question. You answer that first. <laughs> yeah, you go ahead. No, that's okay. I, I, I actually work hard to take out the nuances in whiskey so I can have a uh, standard like a Weiser's Deluxe or the Weiser's Triple Barrel. Uh, that, that's what a blender is. To, so when somebody picks up, it's consistent every time. So we, in, those, in that world, we're trying to make it think as consistent as possibly can and, and not have the nuances. Now, when we're talking about the cast strength lot 40 or dissertation, that's where I certainly like nuances and comparing uh, things as they go along. So I think I think a consumer has certain expectations on certain brands. I think is my answer to that nuance question, and that and you, you know who they are. Some people like collectibles. Some people have likes yeah. to have the same thing and the same comfort over and over again. So um, yeah. Um, so with the whiskey wheel, go on my LinkedIn account, CDN Whiskey. Uh, doc is my handle. Uh, right now I have it. It's one of my most recent posts. Uh, you can save the picture to your computer that way and you can uh, read it in some detail. So the the history of the whiskey wheel, the LCBO approached me, it must be three, four years ago now, uh, and said, uh, can, can you make a Canadian whiskey flavor wheel? And I kind of was being a smart ass back to them and I said, does anybody really follow flavor wheels? And they said, yeah, pe people do. Um, so I said, okay, uh, I'll, I, I'll take up the challenge. And so I started looking at the whiskey wheels because I really didn't follow them myself. Um, and uh, I was actually a little bit disappointed in what they were telling me. A lot of it I thought was from more of a sommelier's point of view where it's talking about flavor descriptors. And, uh, uh, but it really didn't talk about the origins of the flavors or, or from a master blender or a master distiller or a brewer's perspective. So I put pen to paper and what you see there, um, it took me about a day to make. I got the original Microsoft Word that I did it in. It took marketing nine months to make it look like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, however, it starts in the middle, uh, the, the, the center ring of the wheel. Flavor only comes from three places. It comes from yeast, the grain, or the wood, in the case of Canadian whiskey, because we can age in a wooden barrel. And somebody questioned me, why don't you put oak? I said, well, we can use wood in Canada, so that's why I put wood on there. The second ring of the wheel are the things that we can manipulate as brewers uh, or distillers. 
so the yeast that we talked about, we can control it to make fruity, floral, green grass, soapy notes by changing parameters or, or the environment of the yeast. We can change the grains around, uh, wheat, barley, corn, rye. So that's the grain portion or the barrel we can burn in a certain way. That's the cast portion or we can finish it or we can age it uh, as we talked about aging uh, a little bit earlier. The third ring of the wheel are what people uh, talk about for whiskey wheels. Those are your flavor descriptors like vanilla, caramel, toffee, spicy, banana. Um, and I think the one of the interesting things about this whiskey wheel is the fourth ring is the molecular compound that causes that flavor. So I'll pull up my molecule here I have as my prop. So here's here's 4-ethylgiacol uh, that I made here. Um, that's your spiciness that comes from rye. So if you, if you want that spicy that we sometimes call it the warm Canadian hug, that's yep. 4-ethylgiacol. That's the, what we're trying to to get out of the grain rye or distill it in such a way. Or here's a vanilla. I got the vanilla here. I was doing that. Uh, I'm missing a double bond here if anybody's really clever. But uh, anyway, um, <laughs> I ran out of I ran out of the gray things. Anyway, the outside ring of the wheel is the molecular compounds that causes that flavor. And uh, our friend Davin Dave Broom uh, referenced us when we introduced this once at the uh, in Victoria. He called that a distillery cheat sheet. And it really. <laughs> Uh, it really tells you where your origins of your flavors and what we're monitoring as distillers and brewers and what we really want to achieve. And, and uh, I, I get a lot of people commenting back to me, Dolph, that this is, wow, this is, a, this is something different. And I know, Dave, you have some brewing background. I've, I've, I've challenged brewers to make a similar flavor wheel with beer. All you have to do is change it from yeast grain to hops. I think that would be fantastic. Yeah. I think that'd be a very clever wheel or you can change it from yeast wood to grape. If you're in the, in the wine world, uh, Nick, I think you said you started in the wine originally. I mean, take it to tequila, take it to rum. I think this is a template that can be used for, uh, for flavor wheels in, in our industry. I, I really think, I think the struggle with the one I would have is gin. I don't know how you do that, but uh, uh, I, I think, I think it's, it, it is. And then, to add to it, I got the next level, and Davin, I know you've seen it. What you can do is also is a polar histogram where you can actually then make bar graphs around the middle of the wheel, and you can see how much impact in the flavor you're drinking, and that's the next level to this. I don't know if people are quite ready for that, but whenever <laughs> I show them in, in uh, master classes and everything, people, yeah, now I know what the whiskey's going to taste like even before I put it to my lips. I know what's giving me the flavor, where it's coming from, and how it should taste. Like why is this deluxe going to be all around the middle of the wheel? Uh, uh, whereas, you know, the dissertation, which I'm drinking now, is going to be more flavors coming in from the rye and, and from the yeast. Thank you, sir. And who does not want a cheat sheet? I'm, I'm a teacher. Every kid wants a cheat sheet for every test ever. Can we have a cheat sheet? for? No, you can't. But, make your own. but, but yeah, make your own. Do it. Yeah, I don't know, Dad, uh, do you have any more comment to it? I know you use it in whiskey fests and, and, and things. If anybody uh, uh, quite, quite, quite honestly, I think that, that this is a great way for people to visualize the three um, uh, sources of flavor. And it goes back to what I was saying a little while ago, that people like to know where flavor comes from. And, and at the time I was going to say, for example, look at the popularity of the, the whiskey wheel that, that, that Don has, uh, has uh, developed. But I left that for you to say, and, and you did. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but, uh, but getting back to nuance, I think that is the most important part of the whiskey. Because we have to remember, first of all, that the character impact chemicals are often... So they're in such trace amounts that you can't assay them to begin with. And uh, I think that um, this is what, you know, there are like tens of thousands of different chemicals that we can smell with our nose. But the way these interact together is what creates the flavors. As individual chemicals, we don't really smell the individual chemicals. We smell them in concert with a bunch of others, you know. So I, I think that, you know, uh, you really want to be able to uh, to, to practice tasting whiskey so you can get the differences. And I'll tell you a really exciting thing that has happened to me. I think people know that I've just written a new book. I'll flash it up here just, just so you can see. But uh, Definitive Guide to Canadian Distilleries. Um, and I've been tasting all different kinds of spirits. And what is truly exciting to me is that I can taste all different vodkas 
which a lot of people think are flavorless, but I have really worked on developing my palate of more than 20 years developing my palate. And I did do a full two year sommelier program, learning how to taste wine and pull flavors out of wine and things like that. But um, so I can tell like, like when you taste vodka that's made with milk permeate, you, it, you can sense some of those dairy smells in that. When you taste vodka that's make, made out of maple sap, there's a subtle little, not sweet, but there's a subtle little woodiness that like is it's that flavor of Sotolon that tells you when you're tasting real maple syrup and when you're tasting fake maple syrup. You know, and when you taste vodka that's made out of blueberries. So what it's done for me is it has give, given me an immense pleasure tasting uh, a, a spirit that many people just dismiss. You know, they, they, they you know, just use it for, you know, as an alcohol donor for, for, uh, for mixed drinks. So I think that it's really important for people to, to practice their um, uh, tasting so that they can pick up those, those nuances. Now, you know, you, you say you try to, Don, you say you try to eliminate those from some whiskeys, and there are some that you really do want to get rid of because some of them are just flaws and faults. But, you know, um, there are also others that maybe you can't um, uh, actively uh, measure them or develop them, but that are important to be there. And that's, I think, where the art of blending comes in. When you can take a whole bunch of different components and together create something that is much more than the sum of the parts, that gives people a truly wonderful feeling. And this is why some wines are so tremendously uh, uh, popular and expensive. It's because a person who has spent their whole life tasting wine, and I, I've, I've sat and, and tasted wine with some of the most uh, prestigious winemakers in France, for example, gone to their meetings and tasted their wines, and they, you know, <clears throat> They can just taste these incredibly subtle flavors in these different wines, and they're really very good about just telling each other uh, what they think of their of their wines and so on. So um, I agree, you want you always want it to taste the, the same from one batch to the next to the next to the next to the next. Otherwise, people are going to bring it back. But that doesn't mean you have to eliminate the subtleties and the nuances. And if, if I could give you a really good example of a whiskey that I think is a wonderful whiskey, a really thrilling whiskey that if you can enjoy with water, with ice, with ginger ale or neat, it's, it's Weiser's Deluxe. And that's an entry level whiskey, but that whiskey is, you can rely on it to taste like it did the last time. But it's, at the same time, you can get a tremendous amount of pleasure. And you know that whiskey changes as you dr drink it. It changes on your tongue. It really uh, gives you a really wonderful uh, uh, experience if you just allow yourself to taste it as whiskey and let it develop in your mouth. So I think that maybe when we're talking about the importance of nuance, we're talking maybe about different things. Because, you know, as I was saying at the Canadian Whiskey Awards this year, this year, you know, Weiser's whiskeys and Corby whiskeys have Don Livermore's fingerprints on them. And they are wonderful, terrific whiskeys. But I have to tell you, man, there is a huge amount of nuance in those whiskeys. And that's what makes them so exciting. Beauty. <laughs> and that's going to segue right into what's in your glass, Devin. So we're talking about the nuances. Tell us about the nuances in your glass. Well, I've switched to Union 52. It's what I'm drinking right now. <laughs> and, and I, I, I honestly, here, I just, I just truly love this. And I got this because you, Mammy, I thought, you know, we've got that really, really old heated whiskey in there, probably Lafroy. And, uh, and uh, I thought maybe we could put, Pull some you mammy or that we can't, you know, I, I can't in any case, maybe some people can. I love the, the, the subtle peating of this. And this really shows how far peat goes. It doesn't have a lot of peat, peated whiskey in here, but you can taste it. And at the same time, you've got all those other flavors floating on top of it. It's just, to, to me, I think that this is, uh, you know, like this is a masterpiece. You couldn't make this if you didn't have a, a warehouse that had been full of barrels for you know, a century or more, you know, where you've got old things like this just sitting there waiting to be, to be uh, discovered. Davin, could I see that bottle again? Because I don't know if I recognize it. 
Is that only Ontario? Possibly? I think it's BC. Don? Yeah. yeah, British Columbia. It, okay. was, it was released uh, four years, three, four years ago in British Columbia as a limited release. And Davin's absolutely correct. We we utilized the 909 regulation in Canada where we blended in 4% of a 52-year-old scotch that was laying around in our warehouses. And the 96% of it is why is it red letter? Laying uh, around in the warehouse, eh? Yeah. yeah. Well, there was 18 barrels left. And in, in after 52 years of aging, uh, the 18 barrels, we consolidated it down to one. So that just shows you how much evaporation and concentration it got, goes up to it. And, wow. and then basically blending it in at 4%. I, I remember Dave Broom talking about it uh, when we had it at, at the Victoria the one year. And he, he said that that I find it, it's a mesquite taste to it. I don't know if that's what you're tasting there in there, Davin. But personally, that's what I get out of that one. Mesquite. Mesquite. And he said that was the 1960s malt in uh in uh, he's a very classic uh, taste mm. uh, he, uh, he recognized from the 1960s. So I, I think when whenever Canadian whiskey gets, they talk about the 909 rule. I said, I, I we've always done it. I, I've got Canada's oldest <laughs> recipe oh. book from Iron Walker that's he was blending in wine and Jamaican rum and his original whiskeys in the 1880s. I mean, uh, it, it's something. And then the guys that uh, buy and source the, the the those 909 things for us, those are the more expensive ingredients. Right. I mean, it's just one more paint to the painter's palette and the nuance that Davin's talking about. That uh, yeah. I think that's what makes Canadian whiskey incredible. Yeah. Everybody does it. They just do it their own way. You know, yeah. the, the Scottish do it by soaking the wine into the staves and then they it soaks out the whiskey. The Americans are allowed to add up to 2.5 percent of yeah, anything as long as it's not harmful. Yeah. You know, <laughs> the the the, uh, the uh, Irish do the same with you know soaking it in like like Pike Creek and. And so, you know, everybody does it just as somehow they've pointed the finger at us as if it's a bad thing. But, uh, uh, you know, I'm a guy who has hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bottles of whiskeys upstairs in my office. And when Union 52 came out of, you know, I tasted it and I bought a case. Wow. Well, Dad, and you know what you could sell that for now? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You know what? For, uh, it'll support you into your third book, Davin. That's all right. Yeah, you know what? When my bottles reach a thousand dollars, I break the seal, so I'm never tempted to taste them. Oh, and uh, I just I just gave my dad today a bottle that that I we look up the price online. It's one thousand four hundred and sixty dollars. Oh, and I said, okay, Dad, this is whiskey's just getting too good. You you now own this full bottle. Of course, I've got another bottle, but uh, <laughs> you're a good son, Devin. Good for no, you. No. Oh, I love my dad. There's no question about that. But he's got a great palate, and he can appreciate it. Good for him. Yeah. So, but yeah, you're right. It's a. I think it's outrageous the price that some whiskey goes for no, these days. Crazy. You know, it's just insane. Don, let's see what's in your glass. I know it's the district. Well, maybe you're done. I don't know. Uh, when you put me off camera, I report. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I, I, I did report with dissertation again. So, yeah. <laughs> um, I, as the Union 52 uh, was to British Columbia, the provinces now in the different states and liquor stores are becoming uh, much more demanding. They want their exclusive uh, releases. Um, so, this was Ontario's release when they they first approached me. Must it must have been the same year as Union 52. Uh, can you do a unique uh, blend for us? And I said, Well, I've, at that time, I didn't really have a lot of aged inventory of anything. And I said, all I kind of have left is the stuff I've left over from doing my PhD. Uh, and they said, well, we'll take it. So I had 78 barrels of it. Uh, and it was just a mixed mash of, of different char levels and pot distilled rice and column distilled rice and double distilled corn whiskey uh, yeah. aged around uh, the 14 year mark. Uh, I, I was I was playing with something different. I wasn't even really intending to blend whiskey when I was playing with this. So mm -hmm. brought the barrels in. Um, just mix them all together. It's very rye forward. It's got a lot of, uh, of the lot 40 component into it. That's got a number four char, which is a deep char, uh, in it and just regular column to still rye as well. So, um, just blended it together, uh, re released it. I, the fun thing I like about this brand is, um, the last thing blenders decide is what strength of alcohol do you want to make the release at? So how much water do you want to put it into it? And Scott, uh, we were talking before this, Scott's the blender that works for me. Uh, him and I debated back and forth as to what strength. Should it be 48%? Should it be 43% the original strength of Canadian whiskey? 
we went back and forth days to days and finally went back into to my office one, uh, the one day and I said to Scott, I said, it should be 46.1. I was, why the hell do you want, I don't understand why 40, the relevance of 46.1. So if you were to add up all the carbons and hydrogens and oxygens inside the molecule ethanol, its molecular weight is 46.1. So Perfect. this is about educating people and about the dissertation. Uh, that's we thought and then stuck and I, i've now actually seen a few more whiskeys out there releasing that 46 <laughs> uh it actually balances quite nice there, there is a little bit of method to the madness at higher strength you're going to get more of the woody and rye spices as a perception nuance yep. the more you add water you open up your whiskey that's where the more fruity and floral notes will start coming out so there, there is a reason why you do it and we wanted the rye uh, and the new woods that we were playing with this certain to be prevalent it's delicious it's ma it's, it's a gorgeous whiskey Full rye, any lot 40 fan, bourbon fans certainly would appreciate this whiskey. And I know we put it in the World Whiskey Awards in 2017. It won the world's top one of whiskey. All righty. Nick, which, you ready? Which one was that again, Don? The dissertation. It's a limited release. It was all, it was my PhD. Oh. I, I can show you the bottle here. I'll put it up to the screen. Well, I've heard about it. I've just never seen it. Yeah, well, you'll see two when you come to my place, buddy. So Okay, there you go. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. One open and one holding on to it. So uh, uh, I asked him to taste it today and to give us the notes. Be well, because I was debating if we should do it as a tasters for the Alberta Scott Society. So yeah, uh, it, it was a single release, Dave. It, it was never uh, intended to be re-released. Now I got so, barrels put away. Now we started distilling some more of it again, but I mean we're years and years away from it. So I'll so probably I, be re retired as a single release. Uh, where did it go and how many bottles went? Uh, there were 7,000 bottles and it just went to Ontario. Okay. And for what I saw about, about six months ago, I saw it in a shelf in Toronto once and I said, what the hell? I don't know what the LCBO was, was doing. Every once in a while, they, they, they squirrel them away in their warehouses and they put them on the shelf. And then I, I tweeted it out or, or put it on my Instagram and, and within hours, people came and, and picked, uh, picked them up. So if you, anyone can find a bottle of dissertation for uh, Dave, uh, uh, get in touch with them. <laughs> Excellent. All right, Nick, you're up. Um, this actually is really striking me uh, Canadian through and through, and it's almost all those stereotypical notes. It's um, the Pendleton 1810 that I'm drinking. Yep. Uh, it is uh, the chocolate crunchy bar, the spun toffee, maple syrup, and I'm, I'm going to be a little bit pretentious here and say it's the Quebec maple syrup, which is sweeter. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's two Ontario boys there might dispute it, but that's okay. That's good. <laughs> I have uh, a lot of uh, New Brunswick maple syrup come in and uh, uh -huh. it's got a taste to it. So this is much sweeter. Um, there's some really cool uh, menthol notes, almost minty on it. And it's soft and buttery, which you don't usually think of Canadian whiskey, so it's really cool. It's just, it's stereotypical. It's a rye, right? Hmm? It's a rye, right? So that, to get a buttery rye, not too common. No, but it, it just hits your palate as buttery. It's soft, it's smooth, it's 40 ABV. It's nice, it's an easy drink. All right. Uh, Dave, you ready? Uh, yeah, sure. All right. Again, here we go with the uh, Goodridge and Williams. And I, it's just been sitting on my shelf for a while. Uh, one of the whiskey guys recommended it to me, and I'm kind of disappointed that I actually bought it. But I wanted to talk about it. Davin, last week you said that uh, some people are lacking in picking up flavors and tasting and that kind of stuff. And I think you were talking directly to me. I don't think I said lacking. Uh, <laughs> I don't think I said something that was negative or derogatory. <laughs> you would never do that, Devin. I believe you. No, because everybody develops at, a, at their own pace. Well, yeah. and I know we all pick up different things and that kind of stuff. And yeah. so after, last, after my dismal performance last week, I've been sampling this whiskey all week long. And <laughs> I've been chewing on uh, raw vanilla. I've been tasting liquid vanilla from Mexico. I've been sticking my finger in some butters, uh, some maple whiskey 
stuff that my girlfriend has here at the house. And I just can't pick up anything on the nose. When I first smelled it, it smelled like white paint to me. <laughs> but when I tasted it, when I do do taste it, I get I get a, a very quick butterscotch and then it's gone to alcohol. Which one is, is that, that a 25 year you said? No, this I couldn't tell you. Uh, Goodridge and Williams was sold to Labatt's. Okay. I can't read I can't read the label. What's that? Which which one is it? Western grains, okay. Yeah, okay, sorry. I think they had two of them. There was a Western grains. Northern grains, yeah. 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 And so what I did was I took another glass and I watered it back. It comes in at 40 ABV. So I added approximately just under half the, the volume and watered it back. And it's got a way different nose now, and I can't describe it. And it's it's uh, the alcohol's gone. The alcohol uh, flavors have gone away. It's uh, it's a little more mouth coating. I, I enjoy the feel now in my mouth a little bit more. But uh, Dolph, I'm going to leave you some of this in my mailbox next time you're rummaging through it. Excellent. And I do that to people's mailboxes. I just go in right now because there's a lot of good stuff out there. Dave, Dave, Dave. Sometimes I when I hear people say uh, tastes like paint. Yeah. Or or, air, or airplane glue and things like that. That tells me it's got a lot of age to it. That's why I asked that question. I can't imagine it being this old because they started distilling in 13. It's about four years old. It's a four years old. Yeah. Um, Dave, there's a, there are two tricks that you can use if you want it to suss more uh, nuance out of a whiskey. The first one you understand, dilute it down to about 23% and suddenly it all blooms in front of you. I remember John Hall once saying we were tasting all the different Confederation oaks. And he says, you can sit there for half an hour, an hour and work on it. Or you can add some water and find it, figure it out in five minutes. And it's really true. Adding water really helps. The other thing is to take a whiskey you know well in one glass and the whiskey that you're trying to analyze in another glass and go back and forth, back and forth, because you can, will compare the one to the other. And suddenly all kinds of new notes will jump out of the, of the glass because it just it, 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 you're doing contrast between it. And if you smell the same thing over and over and over again, your nose gets fatigued. And you just, it, it, it's pointless. You just can't, you just can't get any more out of it. Yeah, no. I have to quit. And that's why I, I sampled some this morning, like this afternoon. I mm -hmm. had some a couple times during the week and I just, I just can't figure it out. And mm -hmm. so. I just, I, Dave, a little trick if you're getting fatigued. Oh, I've been doing that all. Yeah. 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 You're, you're zero. After dram stuff that we were going to talk about, Davin's already touched three things that we we're going to do in the after dram in two minutes, and Don the other. Good, <laughs> good segue, boy. <laughs> Very well. But we are going to go to Kent as Kent's going to tell us what he's got. So originally, I was going to do this one. This is the red wine cat. Yep. Um, after putting my nose and both sides around it, I can't say anything good about it. So I decided to go to the Canadian CC 20 year old, okay. which I have lots of good things to say about this. Um, the, this one, I was reading a little bit, Gavin was talking about this, this one being the same as the six year old, just 14 more years in the barrel. And um, I can't speak to that because I don't have the six, but that being said, Originally, when I got into this, I, we talked about my sweet tooth. Um, I came out with a lot of brown sugar on it. Uh, it had a pleasantly like, musty wood smell to it, and then a little bit of a, a almost like a rum raisin, and then finished kind of with the caramel corn. Again, all you know on that sweet side of my my flavor profile. What uh, I found interesting on the tail end though is I almost got like a a little bit like a mint on it, which I was a little bit surprised at with everything else being so sweet. And maybe you guys can probably tell me where that comes from. But uh, again, on the palate, it comes in with just a nice light brown sugar toffee, a little bit of an orange zest to it. And then I found it, it, just, it finished up, it had a nice finish to it. It wasn't too short. It wasn't too long. Just kind of a medium length. And again, finishing with more caramel corn and, 
and a little bit more orange zest to it. Uh, overall, it, it's just amazing. It sounds fantastic. <laughs> yes. uh, I will have samples for you, Dolph. <laughs> oh, you're a good man. You're a good man, Ken. That's why I do. I keep poking people. You can give me this. I, in this. That one's a nice whiskey. I've had that a number of times. It's it's nice. Yeah, yeah right. I, I was very very impressed. With it. And at that sixty five dollars a bottle, it's only located in one place in Edmonton that I could, could find it. Um, and thanks to you know our ass membership, it was almost ten percent off. So and <laughs> you know, just well over sixty dollars our cost after taxes. So. Hey, Kurt. We're here to serve, buddy. We're here to serve. Can we right. see that bottle again? Kurt? Oh, here. I'll focus on him so you can see yeah. it. Okay. Thanks. Uh, and we've seen that. Where'd you get it at? Kurt, where'd you get it at? Uh, one beyond on the south side. Southgate. Or Southgate. Yeah. Oh, Southgate. Okay. Yeah. They're, they had 13. They now have 12 bottles on the shelf. So. <laughs> oh, and, and less and less after this. Uh, so mm -hmm. for me, I did the Lot 40, and I'm not going to talk about this now. We'll talk about it during the after jam because I'm we got to wrap this up kind of quick. I'll do two more questions after it, then we'll do the after jam. I'm doing the Lot 40. This is uh, the Cast Strength 12-year-old. But what I wanted to do tonight for me it was a little bit fun. I wanted to sample this on its own and then sample it with this. But I made my cast strength into a 43% as well. So we've got the cat. I've got three, three of these. So the cast strength, we've got the lot 40, 43%. And then we have a lot 40 cast strength that I brought down to 40%. So let's put some distilled water in here. And I just wanted to see how they're going to compare once I brought the cast strength down to the 40. And the color is a little bit, uh, I don't know if you can tell, they're fairly close, but the, the lot 40 that was not distilled down, the non-cast strength, is a little bit darker, I believe. So when we do the after dram, we'll talk about this. And I just wanted to see if they would taste very, very similar or uh, vastly different, or vastly, if they would taste different. So that was kind of my experiment today, which I wanted to do. It's kind of fun. Uh, we're going to go on to a couple more questions. And we talked about taste. And we talked about uh, not smell, but the aromas. I want to find out from people, and we'll have everyone on at the same time, if we are more driven towards the flavor or the smell. So when you taste or smell something, what has what's more intense for you to bring you back into your memory state and i'll, I'll tell you for me a, a smell is uh is more intensely related to memories for me than taste can i i'll ask everyone davin where are you is it taste or smell that brings you back to the memories uh smell and smell for you except, and? For, except for very vile flavors no. <laughs> yeah yeah I agree with that. Uh, Kent, where are you? Uh, definitely smell. Some of my best uh, memories are, well, burning coal comes back from the grandpa and grandma's farm, right? It okay. just triggers instantly. Nick? I think Nick's Nick? wrote. Nick might mm -hmm. know. I see you're flickering. Nick, which one? The flavor, or is it the aroma that brings you back to the intense memories? You know what? For me, um, I'm going to say aroma, but there's some intense memories flavor-wise, but not negative, but they're very strong. Um, that will catch me. It will be, ironically, yeasty on the mouth, and that um, triggers a very strong memory. All right. Good. You come, Dave. It's uh, it's smell for sure. Uh, I always find it interesting when people are smelling the whiskey or smelling a beer, and then they taste it. They go, "Wow, that doesn't taste like it smells." Like it, I always like that. I always like it when I hear that. And Doctor Don, I uh, court. I'm going to give the complicated answer. <laughs> I'll, I'll focus on you too. There we go. <laughs> Um, probably 90% of it's nose, but, uh, I, I can do my job well with, with nose. 
there's a couple of things I, I do better with taste. Um, and, and it's more around negative for taste. Um, there, I know competitor products. There's certain flavors that give me a lingering uh, impression on my tongue. And I, I can tell who is selling to who just because of the taste. Um, <laughs> the, the other one I can taste better than I can smell is the tails on a pot still. Okay. Uh, there's certain flavors I know when they've let the pot still go on for too long that turns me off. And the third th third one that I, I know I can taste better than I can smell is Giosmin. And that's a negative Ooh. taste. That's the musty character. It leaves a, a, a lingering, uh, more lingering in my tongue than an instantaneous. And I think, I think for all three of those, it's a lingering effect on the tongue. Whereas nose right away, it's there. And most of the tastes are right away. It, it's the lingering effect on just a few things that that uh that get to me okie dokie uh dev and this question's for you and don and anyone else after that mm -hmm. um because i'm just trying to synthesize the information i got in, in section three from your book okay. and i i just want to say, am i correct in describing blending in its simplest description as a balance between strong and lively versus soft and mellow in flavor and feel should i say that or am i missing something in there i think that's a bit of an oversimplification <laughs> i think what you want what you're looking for is balance but not necessarily those particular uh, uh balances and, and balance can involve more than two different elements so um i think that uh I think that's an oversimplification. You know what? Don does this every day of the of the year. Why don't we ask Don? Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're going hey, to Don. Yeah, uh, it's it's product dependent. It it, re it really comes. There's a certain segment of people that want strong. Your your cask, uh, strength people, your ride. They just want big, strong whiskeys. And then there's yeah. certain segments that just want just. It, it depends on the brand what you're trying to achieve and when, and when we when we're working with marketing and we do work with marketing all the time they that's on their project brief do you want it strong do you want it smooth or do you want something in between i think you're trying you're trying to describe something in between uh and yeah. we do make whiskeys for that that occasion and it, it, it depends on on the brand uh, to be honest with you all right uh, maybe that's what you meant by oversimplification davin <laughs> well and like no, i said no, no. i think that you know let's see real clear yeah all righty thank you ladies and gentlemen so uh we've come to a very quick hour and seven minutes and uh all too quickly finished but we are going to continue in the after dream and everyone always invited back but what i would like to finish this off with is uh a, a dedication to a good friend jay wheelock and uh I'm, I'm not sure, Don. I think I'm pretty sure you met him because with uh, he's visited the distillery, yeah. Oh, excellent. And dad, we commented online and and we commented last night. We had a vi vi well, a virtual kind of hug last night on Instagram where we were reading out some of the comments, and there were just hundreds of comments about uh, Jay's passing. And I'd just like to dedicate this to him a, a virtual hug to his wife. And uh, his wife Kate and his family, and I'd I'd like to thank everyone here for joining us today. Thank you, Don, Doctor Don. It's been fantastic again, Davin and Don, the Canadian whiskey royalty. I don't know if we can get much better than having you two on the same <laughs> show at the same time. Uh, Nick with the whiskey bells. We've got my whiskey ass friend. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can't say it without smiling, Kent. I'm sorry. And Yukon Dave, always fun having you on. And you're always colorful. I love it. When I look in the background, buddy, you just bring out the whole screen. It's all there. Some so, of my dear background right there. It's, it's yeah. all good. Uh, this was our third rendition. We're going to go to our third of the after dram where we're a little bit more relaxed. But I saved a couple questions for then. And again, let's just show the books again so we see it. This is number one. And Canadian whiskey, the new portable expert. There's number two. We got him. The <laughs> definitive the guide to Canadian distillers. You can buy that online right now. Yeah, you I know? can get it on laptop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Like, you know what? It, 
and we <laughs> talked about the pitchers before, but laptop, you don't it doesn't do the pitchers justice. And I'm I'm really I'm a visual guy. I love to have my pictures, and this is a beautiful tone. So uh we're not talking about this now, but it 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 it's worthy of a couple cents. You just pay for it, it's good. Go online, get it sent to you. I I think this one came from no Canada Post. I got it in two days. So Davin said, we it. I think we got it in two days, buddy. This came quick. So when, when did you order it? No, Davin oh. got it for me. Oh, okay. Davin, and I was talking to you all about it and uh, very happy. And Davin, when I introduce it, is it, do I call you co authors? Yeah, we're co authors. Blair, you Blair? as much as I did. Yeah. Perfect. And yeah. Uh, so I'm going to sign off now. And those of you that want to come back to the after drama, I'm sending the invitation. I need to thank everyone again. This was a fun hour. It it uh, it went by too quickly. And again, a third of my questions that I thought I was going to be asking at this point went out the side because we just heard better answers and better quips and the back and forth of this. I really love. So having six peoples on the panel and uh, two experts, Canadian whiskey royalty. It's fantastic. I'm going to sign off. Anyone else want to say a bye note? Yeah, I would. I just add to the group if anyone wants to follow me on my social media feeds, uh, I don't have it along the bottom here, but it's uh, CDN Whiskey Doc. That's without an E in Canada. CDN Whiskey Doc. I'm on Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Okay. Yeah, I got that written down. I'm following you already, Don. Okay. Join us next week at our fourth, and we are doing half of the chapters. And just as a quick reminder for those of you that are doing this and watch this afterwards, it is section four and chapters 10, 11, 12, and probably 13. And Don, you could have been at either of them because you guys are shown prominently in the next section as well. So <laughs> we'll be drinking your 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 lovely liquid, and I'm going to keep tasting the ones behind me. And if you're next, I want to talk to you about the Canadian whiskeys of the hockey, the alumni series, because sure. just a personal couple questions, anyways. Sorry, and I get to throw those in because I'm sitting up here with the controls. So thank you very much, everybody. We'll see you on April 18th, a week from today, 7 o'clock at night. Thank you all so much. And hopefully we'll see you at the after drama in about five minutes is what it takes me to get organized on my side. Thanks all so right. much. Cheers. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Thanks, Gavin. Thanks, Don. Thanks, Gavin. Thanks, Gavin. Thanks, Gavin. Thanks, Gavin.